So on behalf of this gathering, I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the First Nations people of Australia's, Australia and Elders past, present and emerging. This is our Leaders, Innovators and Disruptors event um, for June and we're lucky today to have a circular economy panel discussion and we have some amazing women that are, are leaders in this space um, and key innovators. So I might start off with Kay Ringvall, um, is a leader in the sustainability field and has been um, in the field for more than 20 years, working, studying, exploring the many facets and make up sustainability as we know it today. Her first job as a graduate was in a recycling process plant in Fremantle. So you're a WA girl, Kate. I do, yes. Yeah, remains an avid recycler. <laughs> And Kate yes. has a master's in public policy and a PhD in planning, sustainable, uh, and her areas of expertise are in circular economy, sustainability, the business, sustainable urban planning, sustainable cities, trans, um, sustainable transport, transit orientated development, and energy efficiency in the building environment. Oh my God, what a <laughs> mouthful. Uh, so, Kate's also. So worked for governments, large corporations and universities and more, most recently um, she was working with IKEA um, and that leaves a big question mark over that as an organisation when it comes to sustainability as we all know. Yes. Um, we also have um, a Australian Research Council laureate, Professor Veena Sajwala um, and is an international recognised material scientist, engineer and inventor, a revolutionary, revolutionary recycling science. Um, she's renowned for pioneering the high temperature transformation of waste in the production of new generation of green materials. In 2018, Veena launched the world's first e-way micro, micro factory and in 2019, she launched her plastics micro factory, a recycling technology breakthrough. As the founder director of the Centre of Sustainable Materials Research and Technology, SMART, at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, she's producing a new generation of green material and products made entirely or primarily from waste. And then brings us to Annie, our Annie, um, one of our founders at the Macquarie University Incubator um, and is the founder of Sustainable um, Brands Group. And part of that is her Sustainable Schoolwares, which is a unique Australian business making eco school uniforms and thinking about the whole life cycle of a uniform. The business started as My Organic Uniforms in, 2000, in 2013 and delivered Australia's first GOT's certified organic cotton and recycled polyester school basics range. Sustainable schoolwear are keen to do things differently and are committed to creating sustainable schoolwear options that don't cost the earth. So we also noticed that Annie has just launched Warn Up, which is her new business and there's nothing more certain than an entrepreneur who continues to have new ideas and ways of doing and launching new businesses. Um, so welcome, um, ladies, to today. Um, I am very grateful that you've been able to join us today. Um, and now I think we'll just get started and dive into so our first question. So this, is, this question is for all of you. Um, the three of you have been closely associated with material recovery, manufacturing, and remanufacturing facets of the circular economy. This, is obvious, this obviously differs from the circular economy opportunities and service industries. Could you each share um, some immediate opportunities you foresee in your respective industries? Um, can I start just because I think I, I'm going to have a little bit, but these guys are so experienced that they'll know a lot more about it. But for me, I'm a latecomer. Yeah, um, and I've realised that there's actually true value in waste and the trick will be how we realise that value um, and that we're actually wasting the value itself at the moment. And I think that both what Kate and Vina are offering us are ways to actually extract that value and make it um, purposeful um, for both the country and people. And I think it's just a journey. That would be my quick summation. Thanks, Annie. Yeah, I mean, for, for retail, even though I'm technically not in the retail industry now, but, um, you know, I see consumption really moving into a place where people are significantly more conscious about where does this product come from? Who made it? What is it made of? And really starting to ask the question of, 
well, what do I do with it at the end of its life? And, you know, circularity and circular economy isn't just about waste. And we have to be really clear that it's not that. It's actually much more than that. But from, a, from an individual perspective, for most people, it's going to be, you know, what are the products I'm buying and how, how can I amplify a more sustainable way of approaching consumption? And I think you know, brands like IKEA are really taking that and running with it. Um, you know, they have obviously IKEA has has kind of a, a whole wealth of, of information and research that they've done. And other brands are now starting to realise that consumers really want to know what is what is the, the efficacy and what is the transparency of this product and how can I really be a better consumer um, and, and how can I choose better and, and use my dollar power to change the way that we consume in this country? Thank you, Kate. Yeah, and thank you, Melissa, and thank you to uh, Macquarie University for hosting this uh, fabulous uh, conversation with uh, two incredibly amazing, passionate women who bring their experiences to the table. So. <laughs> I think that that first of all is is an absolute joy in this industry when you look at people like Annie and Kate who are bringing their experience and their passion to the table and I think everything that they've said makes so much sense what we are really trying to do is collectively figure out how we're going to actually solve this problem and that's really what it's got to be about it's about our collective passion and what we do in our own ways that's going to make such a big difference so, you know, you look at what, what Annie's doing in terms of collecting uniforms and really to be able to say, you know, how we can actually make this into a valuable resource and a material that can be funneled into manufacturing high quality products. So what it then means is we're talking about, you know, as Kate was saying, it's more than just about recycling, but it's really about understanding how do you make all of this work in a business setting? in a setting where it makes sense both from an environmental point of view, from an economic point of view. And of course, we are people who will need to consume basic goods. We will need basic services. So in this case, example of how a resource like uniform can actually be part of the supply chain where it becomes part of a product that is, again, an important part of our everyday lives. And the fact that we can then channel that into you know, products for our built environment, as, as we have done in this partnership with Annie, is a really good way to think about a, a fabric, an end-of-life textile, that can now become a whole new product. So this is where, of course, that collaboration and that partnership between various people in our economy has to happen. And that then means that we're all integrated in the supply chain. Some of us can be people with materials, that becomes part of a feedstock. Some of us who might be in the built environment and infrastructure industries might look at that as an opportunity to use products that are made out of these types of resources. So I think we all collectively can really make this happen um, as part of this entire um, ecosystem. So I think the core of all of that is, of course, fundamentally the science and the technology that enables new innovative solutions to come to life. And that's where I think it's going to be absolutely critical that we do use manufacturing as, as a way to show that it can be done. So yes, there's the science, the technology, and then the all important component is how do you take capabilities that exist in our ecosystem, so in this case, manufacturing capability to enable this to happen. So I think that that's an important part of the conversation as well. Yep. Yeah, I think the opportunity for retooling um, in this aspect is, is critical as well. And I think that um, what's just happened in COVID and um, Australia actually working out um, our sort of our abilities in, in manufacturing are, are, are there, but we just don't have the capability and the scalability aspect to the, the manufacturing skill sets that we hold here in Australia. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, yeah that, that was quite a bit of a wake-up call for our sovereign capabilities, I suppose, particularly in that area. And I think um, just moving on from that and extending out, and so there is ample data available on the circular economy opportunity in business and some specific data points for Australia too. So how do these opportunities translate into Im implementable business models? So how do people actually see the, the opportunity um, and self-interest and um, 
financial return are always a very big component of that. Mm. Yeah, no, this is exactly why. I mean, of course, you know, the, when we start to automatically have that conversation around circular economy and therefore the business models that have to, in fact, be part and parcel of our thinking, we've got to have all these elements, you know, thought of very carefully. So we've got to be able to understand it's not just about the material that comes into the supply chain, but it's the all important market. And therefore, if we're basically saying, is there a market and for what kind of products? does it make economic sense then the obvious sort of question to ask is that you know are we going to be able to make these products in australia um, in a way that it actually aligns well with our values you know we want to be able to make sure that we're solving these challenges um, and therefore we've got to keep in mind that it's about the economy it's about the environment it's about also social justice you know can we imagine developing new business models and you know these socio-economic models that we can create will help us think how it might also help the regions you know if we're talking about you know regional communities and i know annie you and i were chatting about this um it, it just means that from our perspective we've got to think about these business cases and think about that all important supply chain that says right it means that we may need to understand how big is the market and of course, also ask the question, how small is the market? So yes, if you're talking around Sydney, absolutely massive market opportunities. Does that mean we should ignore what might be happening in smaller communities? Absolutely not, because people still have to worry about waste resources like waste textiles. Um, and people still have to worry about, you know, how they're going to fit out and refurbish their homes, their communities. So that whole built environment piece is a perfect way to think about that ecosystem where the supply chain can meet local requirements. Um, if you can enable those market opportunities to grow bigger and bigger, but also cater for the fact that local economies can also thrive at a regional level. And I think that's the important challenge that's going to come about for Australia is how do we design that business model that allows us to cater for large markets, big cities like Sydney, and at the same time, think about what that might look like in, in regional communities, because we still have to worry about waste textiles. We still have to worry about fitting out um, our homes and our offices. So the markets are certainly there, big or small, the markets are there. And that's why I talk about, you know, economies of scale are important. That's how people think about economic modeling. But we also have to have a conversation where we bring in economies of purpose hmm. as part of our conversation. Um, so yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm certainly excited to hear what my other co-panelists think about uh, what all this means in, in their world. Yeah, look, for me, I mean, IKEA obviously has taken um, a very retail approach to, you know, how, how do they implement this thing called the circular economy? Um, you know, retail, the retail side of the business has very little impact on the design of the product, but that side of the business has the same goals for circularity. So the retail side can really um, concentrate on connecting to consumers. And, you know, that buyback service that IKEA launched last year, that's really, you know, absolutely um, key services and, and in that sharing economy for how people can, you know, continue to use furniture and, and make sure that the furniture that, that they're bringing back to IKEA can be used by someone else. You know, IKEA will look at that um, furniture when it's been taken back, they'll check that it's safe. So there's that whole kind of environment of trust that that IKEA as a brand taking on the sec effectively secondhand furniture um, brings to the market that wasn't there before uh, you know if you've ever tried to sell a piece of furniture you know that there are some um, there's some difficulties with working with some of the platforms that are currently in existence not to say that there's anything wrong with them but I think the thing that IKEA did really well was establish they, they did some research. They, they went out to the, the local community of, of Tempe. They tested that service with them. It became really clear that the one uh, kind of missing piece in, in providing a service like 
a buyback service was that, you know, for most people in Sydney, they've either not got a car, they've got a small car or, you know, some other um, arrangement therein. And so you might have brought your box of whatever it might be, table, into the house, but how are you going to get it to IKEA if it's up and, and IKEA wants it up and, and installed? So that was why they connected to GoGet and GoGet's a, a car sharing platform. They're leading the way for how we regenerate and really shift the thinking around mobility and transport. And, and so it's enabled a whole a whole realm of people to get access to IKEA that they probably wouldn't have had access to otherwise. And they've been able to, you know, and then people have also been able to sell their furniture back to IKEA. And then a whole other new branch of people have been able to purchase that furniture. And I guess in that regard, Kate, you know, I mean, this is where it sort of brings me so beautifully into, into the point that, you know, Annie and I have always talked about from the early days of our journey that, at the end of the day, these are essential products. You know, there is, of course, whether it's our textiles or it's our furniture. And I think we can have another conversation in terms of what it means with the whole sort of world of fashion. And again, Annie, we've talked about this, you know, that ultimately it has to be about sustainable consumption. And I think we, we so should talk about those issues. But I think a classic example of the work you've done, Annie, with your school wear program, which is how our collaboration started, uh, that, that's, I think, an interesting journey for me, as I'm sure it's probably been an absolutely crazy and a beautiful one for you. So I, I do want to kind of understand your, your passion and how mm. it came to be that you kind of reached mm. out and, uh, and, and suddenly before we knew it, we were working together. <laughs> yeah, I know, which has been fabulous for us. Thanks, Bina, and, and agree with both Kate and you. And I think... I am a late comer to it. If I'd known more much earlier, I would have still had the same view that I've developed now, but I wouldn't have had the tools or the expertise or some of the resources available previously. So I think time is right for small businesses like ours. Um, I, I sort of fell into it when I had to have a look at our business. I started studying sustainability and just thinking about what we could do at home. And I've got... Like everybody else, I think I just became more conscious about um, how we contribute to um, our environment and it does have an impact, whereas previously I probably was saw it as a distance or at a distance or someone else will look after it. Um, but when we started in business, um, I started to think, well, what can we do ourselves and what can we do as a business? And that was when we started to look at, well, there's a school in every um, town and there's a uniform worn by most school children. And what we're dealing with is our raw material is something that's quite valuable. And we probably haven't realised the value of that. So that was when I came to Vina and said, we really are keen to do something. What can we do? And I, I think Vina allowed us to be quite open minded about the exploration of what that would be. But through science and the background and the support of that science that's allowed us to make things like, and I, I just happen to have the, my little example, <laughs> well, this is an old <laughs> pair of tracky dacks, believe it or not. For the parents in the audience, you will know what I'm talking about. And to me, that's remarkable. Um, and I think that a lot of people hadn't put two and two together. And it's only when you have to find a solution. Um, and what it opens up then is that solution, as Vina says, can be very regionally orientated because it impacts all of us. And that's why, you know, we were in school wear. We've shifted now completely to being sustainable. But being sustainable to us doesn't just mean create, making from good fibre and putting that sustainable thing in the closet and everything else is potentially made out of non-sustainable items. We're actually trying to transition and help our manufacturers Manufacturers and our schools transition with us because education is key. Mm. But and but what I'm finding is there's not as much resistance. I think people just don't know quite how to get there. And so when you give them the solution, there everyone is very supportive. And mm. we have found that the schools either get it or they're not quite there yet. Um, and that's why whatever we do, we do. I mean we do try and offer the education around it because once you understand something um, people go with you and there's one little example was um, we've done the recycled fiber 
for our sportswear, which is bottles. We've nicknamed it Six Bottles. And when we explain to the parents who are very, things are very price conscious at the moment, as they need to be. And when you say, look, it's going to cost you a dollar extra. Now, a dollar extra is not too much more to pay, but it, in terms of the environment. But when you, when you look at that in a triple bottom line point of view, it's saving the environment $28. So the parent goes, oh, a dollar to save $28? It's a no-brainer. Um, yeah. And when you explain things in those terms, and I think um, going regionally for the manufacturing is also a no-brainer. Mm. I'm a country girl myself, and I think we've got huge resources, really strong capability in, in, these, um, in most of our towns. They were saying last night that a lot of our young people are moving out there into the regional areas. Um, and I think we need to tap into that. And I think there's a lot of an innovation that happens in the regions because mm, you don't have everything on tap. So you make what you need to make. Um, well, I think, and, and, and also, I mean, the critical element in all of that is, is, you know, we are talking about ultimately designing the way new economies can grow. Therefore, out of that, new jobs can grow. Because automatically, if you think production locally, in Australia, you know, people are going, right, okay, you know, really, I can train people up, I can create these new jobs, I can mm. use my waste resources. Um, so I think it's almost starting to then question that have we had that higher systems level thinking before? Whereas yeah. now with this, this sort of crisis that we're in, where we've had in a way almost the double whammy of we were looking at recycling and what we're going to do about it, and now we've had the COVID mm. and therefore... The economic recovery part of it is going to be an important thing front and center of minds for everyone if we can imagine all these you know angles that intersect and we go well actually if we were to use our resources to create these new manufacturing solutions and that's why this whole sort of thing around well what do we need what does that scale look like for production yeah. The scale of production has to be such that the business model tells you it's got to be economically viable. There's no single magic answer that says it's got to be this big or this big. It's about saying, well, what makes economic sense for that region? Because otherwise, you know, you're going to be throwing away your waste into landfill. That costs money. You're going to be carting waste mm -hmm. around over transport long distances. That mm -hmm. costs money. So it's, it's about saying, well, okay, what works in a broader economic sense is to take into account all these other factors also. So when you add in all these other sort of negative costs impost around landfill costs, transport costs of waste, well, you are better off saying, let's kind of imagine what we could do in a particular area, which then means that in that local region, and if we start to think regional, there could well be examples of these kinds of manufacturing capabilities set up. So, you know, the example of what we're doing with our micro factories at UNSW is one case in point where, you know, these modular machines can actually be set up in different regions. You don't have to necessarily cart these materials over long distance. You can be really clever in the way you think about how you might use these resources. So if you do have a local, um, you know, manufacturer, so we've, we've actually also partnered with, um, a manufacturer out in Kuta Mandra, who is basically setting up this micro factory on his side. So there's an example of a region where he could well be partnering with various people in the supply chain. You know, so the fact that Annie, you might have textiles to provide him in the right format of the right type um, means that from his point of view, he can use his manufacturing skills to actually produce some of these products for which, again, the all-important question, is there an economically viable market opportunity? And so if we now bring in, in there, where is the market that we've now shown exist, and we've actually deployed some of these prototypes um, out at Mervax projects. So you've got automatically now a, a building and construction and property developer who's saying, I love these products. How can I get more? And, yeah. and I love the fact that time we have a conversation with them including one uh, this morning was very much about that's great that's great can we also do this and can we also do that so I think to me the beautiful thing that has come out of this type of collaboration is that we all win you know it's a win-win yeah. outcome mm -hmm. for everyone and the end user is suddenly excited with all that innovation 
and it's not just looking at okay the latest project that we've delivered on which is their pavilions out at olympic park so there you go this is this is again something that's part of the press we've just done that for them um and i guess from from their point of view it's about them also being this market leader in what they're doing so they want to be able to go right okay if this means and of course annie they know about you and your your story and the work you're doing because of course they had to know where did this green in my tiles come from? <laughs> right? so, so all of this means that from their point of view, it's, it's such a beautiful story that ultimately as an end user, you know, they've enabled that entire supply chain to come to life. And if you think about it, you know, what we're doing here is really a world's first solution where in this particular instance, it's a combination of waste textiles and glass with a technology that is an Australian technology that has in fact made this happen. So I think again, to me, it's a demonstration of the fact that we can actually design not just the science, the technology, but also that all important question on what does that business model have to look like? Yeah. Absolutely. Is it just about the economy or is it more than that? Mm. We know it's gotta be about the triple bottom line, right? It's yeah. gotta be about and I the think environment. I for me, I think the economy is about people. And yeah. I think that what Veen is saying is right. You have, it has to be commercially viable for, yeah, for everyone to want to A, invest in it, B, buy it, and it has to be workable and functional. So we're not creating products for the sake of it to say that we are sustainable and we're circling back around and isn't this great. It's not a fad. It's actually a way of doing things differently. Differently. And I think that's what's really exciting for me. I feel like we're, there's something that's shifted and I think we've got all of, everything's um, coming together now to make it happen. And I think that those partnerships, they're not as competitive as you'd potentially be in a true product environment where I'm putting this out here and this out here and we're going to one up each other. It's much more collaborative than that because I mm. think people have realised that, you know, slowing it all down a little bit. Um, and I think Vina knows my position on fashion is we focused on school uniforms because we know it's our area and we know that. But we, we want to see people produce less ultimately. Um, yeah. And we think that take back schemes are a fantastic start, but people have to continue that through. I want to know where does that stuff end up? If it's talked about, yeah. is it greenwashing? I, because if it's not, then I want to, I want to know where it ends up because that could be useful to other people as well. Um, we're standing on each other's shoulders a lot of the time. And I think um, if fashion could do one thing, it would be to produce less. Uh, if they're taking mm. back their stuff and be transparent about what yeah. they're doing. And we work with our schools to say, you know, really, we did a sloppy joe and we measured not just what was used in the sloppy joe, but also what the offcuts were. And we took that bag of offcuts and showed um, the numbers, which is unusual for me because I'm not really a numbers person. <laughs> it was terrific to add it all up. And numbers and data are really important, I think. Um, yeah, and I think this, this is where, Annie, it's, it's mm. so good to be able to, when we talk about these real live examples, you mm. know, when we are hopefully telling a lot of these stories, particularly as young people are thinking about, you know, what is this economic recovery going to look like? You know, the, the all important mm. question of young people have been affected, <laughs> you know, with the job losses that have happened. So I yeah. think it's also a way of thinking about, you know, there's got to be hope, you know, we've got to, we've got to be able to have that hope, but think in a realistic way and say, okay, if we're going to create these new economies, what is that going to look like? And therefore for us to have this conversation that says it's about knowing business, it's about knowing data, it's about knowing resources and the waste and recycling. And in this particular instance, if we're talking about built environment as a sector, again, knowing data and information market is there. How do we then connect what we're doing into markets? And we as consumers in the marketplace can use our, our capacity. And if you're a big you know, company or indeed a purchaser who goes into the supermarkets, can make those choices in terms of how you wish to spend your money. So I think, again, you know, as consumers, we buy all kinds of things, whether it's school uniforms or electronic goods, right? So I think to me, yeah. again, that ability to look at this everyday essential part of our lives, you know, whether we talk about clothing or electronic items, absolutely, we have to talk about 
our consumption in a real sense. What can the planet sustain? Yeah. And I again it's not part of the conversation because I think young people get it. I think mm. the important point is how do we then translate that you know passion and desire to you know converting it into if I'm an entrepreneur, if I want to be able to start some new business opportunities and be inspired by people like you, Annie, that look around you, look at you know, what are you really keen to achieve? So bring in both. I think to me, it's, it's both your head and your heart have Absolutely. to work together, you know, which, which is yeah, so got to be authentic. It's got to be real and it's got to be authentic because I think consumers, you know, coming up now in young generations, they want to know that, that the, the brands that they're connecting to have uh, authentic uh, connections to sustainability that what they're talking about and what they're saying their product is doing is actually doing it and and we, brands really have to get on top of how do we how do they communicate better with with you know the, the consumers that they have already and and the ones that they would like to encourage you know onto their um, products and I, I think I I mean I, there's some really great examples um, Patagonia is probably one of my my favorite just because they've really taken that understanding about you know we're not here just to sell you a product we're actually here to help you you know well in Patagonia's uh, case it's you know to be warm or uh, to be active or whatever it might be but you know they have gone out of their way to make sure that the 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 raw materials of their products have integrity and that they stand by them and they would much prefer that you repair the item that you've already got rather than buy a new one. And, and I think that's where brands really need to kind of play. Um, you know, IKEA really hasn't started in that space yet, but could do. Um, and maybe, you know, the buyback service maybe is part of that, but yeah, absolutely. As consumers, we have to be significantly more conscious about what is this product made of? Where has it come from? Who made it? How are they? How are they being supported to do that? And am I okay with that? And and that that information has to be absolutely transparent, and it has to be easy to find. Yeah, uh, well, well, this is it, isn't it? I mean, this is why I think Annie, to your point, and Kate, to your point, transparency is an important part yeah. of communicating your messages. So you know, people should be able to see the product. Um, and what happens to the end of its life and how it was made. So when we talk about, you know, the bigger picture of sustainability, yes, it's about the materials and how it's made and what, what happens to it at the end of its life. And, and recognizing that not all the time a product can be recycled back into exactly the same thing. So, yeah. you know, this sort of notion that, oh, you know, circular and circularity is only about converting like for like is not necessarily always the case and it mm -hmm. can't be done. Mm -hmm. A lot of products become obsolete. Electronics is a good example. Does that mean that the materials, plastics and metals that went into making it are now no longer useful? And that's not the case at all, which means you can certainly imagine that in addition to the three hours of reduce, reuse, recycle, you need that fourth hour of reform. So you can take a lot of the materials that are present and bring those materials back to life in different forms mm -hmm. over and over again. And so it's about keeping your materials in your economy um, as long as you possibly can, whether that means that your overarching macro product has completely, you know, reformed into something totally different, which is bringing it right back to, you know, Annie's example of, of textiles, where what we've done is shown there that in our micro factory, it can come back to life. As, as a tile or different types of products in, in the property and the building um, materials and products space. And I think to me, again, the fact that, you know, we don't have to necessarily go, oh, we don't have a glass smelter. Oh, we can't actually recycle glass now. That's too hard. We give up. Well, yeah. no, if you have a glass smelter, maybe part of your glass can be channeled in that direction. That's one way you recycle it back into new glass. And that's great. If you actually have got more waste and you can't process everything in your smelter, let's look at other ways in which it can be processed. So the fact that in, in the tiles that we've you know, manufactured for Annie, we've got combination of glass and textile is a good example of making a product that's hybrid in nature, 
that didn't need to put glass back into a glass smelter. Yeah. And so again, the ability to process materials through many different pathways is important because it's all about, I guess, ultimately being able to execute an idea and to create that impact. So I think when we talk about this whole sort of supply chain and circular economy, all of that, yes, we need to brainstorm ideas and have a lot of these discussions as, as Annie and I do going way back. But I think which of these ideas can be realistically executed? You're not going to say, well, the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to have to send it to the other end of the world to make that happen. Well, that's not sustainable either, right? So again, mm. we talk about transport of uh, waste materials and also products that we have so often just relied on importing products from, from overseas. So I think, again, why are we doing that if it could well be manufactured locally? So again, Actually, you also has to question your supply chains. Mm. Actually, Vina, that's a really interesting point because um, we went out to visit, uh, someone contacted us on Facebook, which is great. People, you know, there's lots of conversations happening and they said that their, their company creates parts for the big brewing companies and they cut them out of hard sheets of plastic, all the different types of plastic that you can imagine. And that they had all of this these bags, giant bags of, it wasn't the even the offcuts, it was the shavings from this large equipment, bags and bags, and that all went to landfill. Would we be interested in having any of it? Um, and we went out to visit them in Western Sydney, I think out near Gregory Hills, and I was staggered. As you say, that from a commercially, uh, we br they bring that plastic in from Germany to cut it, for parts that are made for our manufacturing um, plants. And it just, it's, there's only so much we can all do, but it did just occur to me that we don't need to bring that stuff in. We can find alternatives. Um, exactly. And exactly. The, it's the looking that's, that makes the difference. Mm. And reaching out, right? I mean, this is where mm. this, this kind of collaborative economy, I mean, if we had to sort of think about circularity and circular economy can be achieved through what we've talked about through a collaborative approach uh, so that there is a win-win outcome. So for this particular company who might have a lot of plastic shavings left behind, I mean, I can imagine some of the other projects we're working on where we use waste plastics to make plastic filaments for 3D printing is it's another right. way we can go, right, okay. So depending mm. on what kind of plastic it is, we can look at other ways it could be channeled into our micro factories for production of plastic filaments, which then means that that can then become a valuable feedstock for some other manufacturer, rather mm. than those leftover plastic shavings ending up in landfill. Um, mm. And I've had similar experiences where, you know, people have sort of made products, again, through various visits on, on factory floors, and again, manufacturing sort of, you know, waste left over. But the irony with this particular company was, I went and had a look inside their tip that they were throwing away and looked at all this plastic and I thought, oh my God, this is incredible. It's like, it's like, <laughs> it's like gold. Consistent, exactly, like consistent mm. quality, you know, because it's, it's absolutely going to be same thing day in and day mm. out. Why are we even putting that into a rubbish tip? If this should mm. actually be logically connecting into that whole ecosystem of saying, who is the next purchaser? of that material Absolutely. but to enable yeah. that to happen it means we again need to have that science and technology that makes it logical to say that mm -hmm. this could then be channeled into that purpose and i think yeah. to me that's in a way what this conversation and many many such conversations uh, that are already being triggered off means that mm -hmm. people are thinking about what it means for manufacturing what it means for economic recovery can we think about recycling in a different way? Is It's really challenging business as usual. It's saying, actually, what recycling means, it's recycling, it's reforming, it's manufacturing. It's remanufacturing. So let's not just put that in a little silo called recycling. Let's actually couple it with, you know, really the value add solutions because it's through that value add that we're going to create more jobs in our economy. And I think to me, that's going to be an important point because I think then it means that there's place for all all businesses, big and small, yeah. to yeah. collaborate. Um, but you've got to again 
keep in mind that it's got to deliver on social benefits, you know, so the socioeconomic modeling in, in all of that has to be, has to be done. How many jobs can you create out of this? Um, yeah, is exactly. that going to be an important question? So it's a different way of thinking ultimately, isn't it? It's yeah. um, redefining um, what we think is normal. Um, mm. providing, I suppose, a structure in which people can understand and a language of redefining what we're doing so that it actually is contextualised in what people already understand as processes that, that they've accepted. Um, yeah. It's very hard to just tell everyone, oh, that's rubbish and we all have to go this way. It's like, well, how does that connect into what we already do so that yeah. people can just understand simply, oh, okay, it, it's, it's taking away the friction um, for people yeah. to adopt it is ultimately a, a challenge in itself. But once you get it right, you just find things start to flow. You know, you've hit the artery, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Not so good if you're a mosquito. Um, we've actually got a couple of questions here um, from, from our um, very engaged um, audience. Um, got actually one from Bill King, who Annie knows. Um, he's part of uh, one of the startups here at the incubator. People tend to over discount future revenues and costs. How can we bring the cost of disposal forward to the point of purchase? Oh, excellent question. <laughs> well, I'll take that cake. Yeah, I mean, for me, this, this sits quite heavily into, oh my goodness, shouldn't we have a price on carbon? Uh, <laughs> excuse me, and having you done... You think? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, having done a, a small amount of economics, um, you know, that opportunity cost of doing something else is rarely taken into account and we never really fully understand the cost of doing a particular thing. I always kind of think about if, if the true environmental cost, or, you know, whether that be the future cost or whatever it might be, but the full you know, life cycle cost of us doing anything was actually taken into account, what would we be doing now? We wouldn't be, for instance, taking coal out of the ground and pumping it out into the atmosphere ad finitum and having all of the damage that that creates. We wouldn't be doing that. We wouldn't be creating the kind of waste that we do with our, with our consumption. We, that would make no economic sense if the full cost of all of that was taken into account. And so, yes, that would mean that some companies and some people would not be as wealthy as they are. And I don't have a problem with that because what, what would that, that would mean that actually, you know, benefit is spread far more equitably than it is right now. And, you know, businesses like what Annie is trying to do and what Veena is doing, they would have value. People would go, oh, my God, yes, that makes so much economic sense because you can see how the value is, is kind of taken up. Whereas at the moment, we're not, we're not in that space. We're not taking account of the cost of the, the actions into the future and we're certainly not taking the cost of what we have already are doing. Uh, price on carbon to me that's what we have we need it yeah absolutely and I've also got an, a question here um, that's uh, for the whole panel as well it's from Karen Platt who's our expert in residence here at the Macquarie Incubator um, I would love to know if you have seen any recycling options for natural fibre it appears the main focus is on acrylic fabrics yeah, so I guess, I mean, uh, without giving away too many confidential details, but uh, <laughs> certainly uh, the work that we're doing in textile recycling, the example of what uh, we're working on with Danny, um, the goal is to be able to use all kinds of different materials. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, yes, of course, synthetics are a big part of, of you know, textiles that go to landfill, uh, but certainly there are so many other natural materials um, that we know in many instances are just, again, part of, Part of our lives and um, you know it's not just about what you wear but it's about being used as as products for for many other applications um, so I think for us it's very much about you know looking at the properties the inherent properties of a lot of uh, natural as well as synthetic fibers and really just saying yes if it can be repurposed back into clothing that's great of course uh, but also looking at how it might be recycled and reformed 
to the point I was making earlier, into some other solutions. So there are a couple of um, interesting, shall we call it, industrial solutions that we're working towards, um, which, uh, which really goes down and unpacks what these materials are at the molecular level. And I think that's really pretty much where I'd like to leave it without sort of talking too much about it, is to say, you know, when we talk about recycling and reforming, um, more than just what the macro product looks like, in many instances, we've got to be able to start to looking at what those fundamental molecules are and what they contain. And, and this is how our journey of green steel started all those years ago, when we started looking at, of course, use of rubber tires as an alternative for uh, coal-based um, carbon that's used in steel making. And of course, as people, some people may know, we've now commercialized green steel uh, in Australia and in other parts of the world. But that was very much about saying, there are some basic molecules that are there in tires. How can we harness those without burning, without causing more environmental harm, in fact, minimizing environmental damage, reducing you know, the energy consumption and the efficiency of the steel making furnaces. So we really set ourselves a big, big challenge there. It was not just seen from the lens of recycling, but it was seen very much from a holistic lens, like we've been talking about, about manufacturing steel. What do steel makers want if we were to deliver this as an alternative green steel technology? What do they want this to look like? So Yes, recycling of tires was one part of it, but I think you've got to look at it from a holistic point of view and say, how can we deliver benefits to the manufacturer um, and therefore ultimately to the whole of economy? So green steel was again born out of a lot of those fundamental scientific questions where we're able to show that at high temperatures, the transformation of these materials into something else that was value added um, had to be part of the solution. Um, and, and that's really how we've got to challenge the entire questions, not like for like conversion, like we've talked about before, but really really. And, and I, I was just going to say also, I think for us, it was about um, our preference, obviously, is to find natural solutions for as much as we possibly can. But the com what we're dealing with at the moment in the segment that we're in is that a lot of people use polyester and a lot of people use other fibers. So it's, it's there. And if we wanted to take it out of, out of landfills, so, you know, reduce the landfill and reduce everything else with doing that, that you have to be able to deal with that as well. Um, and in the first instance, and then start to make things better um, around using more natural fibers if you can. Uh, but we, we kind of went, oh, but there's all of this stuff. We can't just dump and run um, and ignore that. We have to deal with that as an issue because it's going to come up again because it's just um, being completely natural, which would be pr preferable, but we've got this big lump over here that we sort of the elephant in the room. And just mm -hmm. I just wanted to go back. There was another question there. there. Um, David Keenan um, has asked Mel about COVID because I'm just conscious of, of time. I... Uh, it says, do the panellists see the opportunity or challenges in the uptake appetite for sustainable solutions with regard to COVID? And I would say I'm sensing a shift. I don't know if it's just me and I don't know how it relates directly to sustainability, but I think everything sort of just slowed down and um, people just questioned things and said, we can go into a pandemic in a matter of weeks and we never really thought that was possible so i think it's sort of people were in shock a little bit and i think when you when you're coming out of that you sort of go oh did we just go through that and i think environmental issues are the same that we but they're a much slower slower burn in a way but that impact is there as well they're turning around and going oh well if that can happen, we need to be conscious of these things as well, that from a COVID yeah, point of view. I agree. Yeah, yeah. And I would also say that it's really pushed us to, to start, think about, that start thinking about how do we want to be in cities, in, for, for instance, and how, what does the f future of work look like? I mean, who, who would have thought, you know, even five Who's going to use those buildings? Yeah, that's right. Who would have thought five months ago that the whole country would go to be, you know, working from home and, and how crazy that was. 
um, you know, and, and the, the businesses that thrived through that, they had, you know, people were agile, that the, the desk and the, the office wasn't really the limit, that you didn't have to work in that space, that you could work anywhere um, at any time. Um, and I, I think that has, that's really, you know, for us planners, that's kind of gone, oh my God, <laughs> that, yeah. that's really totally shifted. How do we think about, you know, how do we use space now? Mm. How do we use, like, not just our own personal spaces, but also how do we use the spaces out in our cities? And, you know, what does community space look like now? And, uh, you know, shops and... Uh, and at a deeper level, what does um, our superannuation investment going to look like with all this corporate um, or all, all this investment they've made in um, all these corporate building. Business, corporate buildings, um, uh, commercial real estate? Um, so that'll be another thing that we have to tackle next, right? Uh, we've actually yeah, got a few more questions on our Q and A as well. We've got a one um, from Alex about reverse garbage runs a pretty well loved business in Marrickville selling a huge range of donated items, some ready to use straight away and some for creative arts or upcycling. Is there a good business case for stopping waste to landfill? Absolutely. And someone can just build a business like that. Absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah, oh, like a thousand times. I mean, you know, the, the, the opportunity that sits within that space of reuse, repair and, and reselling is enormous. And, you know, businesses like IKEA have just kind of scratched the surface with the buyback service. And, uh, yeah, I mean, for me, you know, the Bower is a classic example as well, a place where, you know, they're, they're absolutely educating about reuse and repair. And, you know, it's, it's what our grandparents did. You, you didn't just buy something, use it for a couple of years, and then, oh, something's broken off it. I'm just going to throw it away. And, and yeah, really, to totally. me, that, that comes out to that real, um, you know, the, the, the nexus of what is value and what is price. And, yeah. you know, the real problem that we have as consumers and humans is this real dissonance between, so this item is priced low. It, lots of people can afford it. Um, it might be lightweight. And so if somehow, somewhere in my brain, I go, oh, it must be cheap then. It's been made cheap, you know, so I'm not going to value that as much as something that's really heavy and that costs $1,000. Uh, what? <laughs> Again, they can, you know, it, it comes back to, you know, which is, we've, we've talked about this before on our manufacturing, um, you know, capabilities. And when we talk about repair and reuse and refurbish, I think the other important equation in there is that you don't always have to make the finished product. You can make parts and components. Absolutely. So you can imagine that a whole new manufacturing sector that mm. basically, which is where the decentralization works so beautifully, yep. that mm. micro factories that we talk about are more about making parts and components. Yep. So effectively, you can imagine, you know, your automotive, you know, repair guy who you sort of walk in and the mechanic is basically got, you know what, okay, well, I don't have this part, but, but okay, I know the micro, micro factory down the road, um, you know, has got metal, has got, you know, metal 3D printers. Now they can print a component for you. Mm. Um, therefore, I'll have the component 24 hours. I'll have your car repaired, you know, yeah. in a couple of days. And I think yeah. to me... That's the classic example that we can all relate to because what we relate to is not how quickly it happens, how long it takes. Because often yeah. the mechanic says, well, I'm going to have to wait for three months for this part to come from wherever. Whereas mm -hmm. what we are actually now challenging that business as usual and saying, okay, but if we did repurpose our plastics and our metals and ceramics and all these materials by yeah. seeing them as resource that can be funneled into manufacturing parts and components, then you could have that decentralized capacity across the country yep. that allowed you to do this kind of localized manufacturing. And it's not about stocking massive amount of parts. It's about saying, no. I can print this if I need to in 24 hours. All I yep. need is the all important feedstock right. of yep. high quality materials. Yep. And so again, it's recognizing that where you can end up you know, hitting a road bump and therefore, if we imagine entrepreneurs who are in the business of recycling, 
suddenly start to see themselves as people who are in the business of producing valuable materials, it just happens to be from waste. You know, so I think that first step, and, and I know Annie's smiling away because that's exactly what we've equipped her to do, is to set up the first model and, of a micro factory. <laughs> and yep. you know, it was um, when our first discussions with Vina, the vision is so clear for us. And I know I've got worn up all over the place because, you know, it's a hard message to get out there. So first opportunity. But can you imagine, I mean, every child, potentially every child who goes to school wears a uniform. Every town has a school in it. Every town therefore has the capability to have something like the micro factory that Vina's talking about to process its own stuff from a fiber point of view potentially um, and make its own desks. And, yep. and it's super simple. Um, and, and I guess that was, what was really exciting for us that we don't want to be bringing really using vans and collecting here and collecting there. We, we would love to enable these regions and in the city, these communities that are in the suburbs as well and their little communities in their own right, that they can then do it themselves. Because I think it's going back to your point, Kate, we used to do a lot more ourselves and we sort of palmed it off um, and then we bought it back. Um, and there is things that we we'll probably do that with. But the dream is with for us that, yes, we'll keep making great uh, schoolware. We love what we do in the schools that we partner with. But imagine if we could enable something that really fundamentally helps create jobs, um, creates the people component of an economy that might be struggling and teaches um, innovation in manufacturing yeah. using new yeah, materials. Determined in. way as well for those communities mm. to actually mm. do it for themselves, right? Give yeah. the power back to them mm. to be yeah. able to make those choices. Um, and mm. there is one other question that I'd like to it's probably we'll put to the panel as our final question and, and wrap up with sort of final um, insights and, and, thoughts that you'd like to leave people with. But um, I think Ricardo's question is quite interesting. As consumers, how can we be sure that the green products we buy are authentic and not just a greenwashing campaign? Mm -hmm. And I think that's very much the question for so many people out there. How can yeah. we be sure? Yeah, yeah. Well, how many ab absolutely. Yeah, and how well, this is why, again, you know, when we talk about transparency, I think it's also transparency, not just in that supply chain and where it ends yeah. up. But I think to me, the important question is saying, what is that material fundamentally? And it's like mm. saying, well, if we've used a certain kind of plastic that is difficult to recycle, you almost have to challenge why we're using that plastic for that example. Yeah. You know, kind of ask it right at that fundamental level. So, you know, the greenwashing is really about challenging the norm. Why are we using that particular polymer for that application when really it's a high quality industrial polymer? It yeah. should really do a very different job what we really need is a different kind of material. So, you know, if we're talking about, I don't know, you know, packaging for food or whatever, let's sort of start to imagine if we could streamline some of that and say, right, there are well-defined food grade plastics, yeah. let's stick to that. That makes it easy for us to keep the food grade packaging nice and clear yeah. in that stream. So that can go into manufacturing those products. Let's not have all the other sort of materials that then you bring into the mix and kind of make it difficult for everyone to do their job. So I think part of it is also about, if you challenge and ask the question, it's like now you see with a lot of food labeling where you know, producers have to talk about the country of origin and you have to say how much of that is actually produced in Australia. And I think to me, it's again, similar type of thing where it says, right, yes, on my website, I can tell you more about what kind of plastic or glass or whatever I have used for my packaging. And so people, yes, you can't put all that information on a label. I get that. That's, you know, practically difficult. But I think if companies want to be totally transparent, they should be able to put some information on their website. And if they're really claiming that they've used recycled content as part of their packaging, for instance, well, jump on their website. They should be able to tell you yep. what it is. So what, what I tend to do, and this is what I love about my job. I can read something that says, oh, it's got 50% of this recycled material. So the next journey that we're sort of pursuing now is to be able to come up with science and technology that uses the fundamental material properties. So we understand we can use material properties, but how do we have 
quick ways to make that assessment. So I think it's again helping consumers and businesses to say, right, is there a tool that if I'm sitting somewhere in some other part of the country, can I go to my local university there and determine hey, is that correct? Does this have? So I think for all of us to ask some of these questions, um, and therefore science enables that collaboration between businesses, consumers, universities, research organizations to talk about the all important transparency so we don't have greenwashing. Yep. Can I just jump in there as well? So from a, um, in, from a clothing perspective and apparel perspective, we bought our manufacturing back from China when, about five years ago because it gave us some control. Um, a lot of the stuff that was manufactured out of sight, we often didn't have control um, unless we relied on the certification bodies such as GOTS, who've got good reputations and they're there. But you still have to have some is because we get approached by a lot of people who've got kids with eczema they're allergic to different things allergic to wool allergic to cotton allergic to um, polyester so there's all of these different allergies so you really have to be able to quantify it to do that uh, we, when we went to recycle polyester we had it um, composition tested uh, and we wanted to know where it had come from and we had to send it to the um, or we did send it to the states through our fabric consultancy just to get it toxin tested. Because mm. if you're saying, oh, recycle polyester, everybody goes, oh, that's great. But it, you don't know where the polyesters come from. So it could yeah. be polyester is a plastic. It could be hospital waste. It could be this, it could be that, you don't know. So testing that it hasn't got toxins in it, testing that it hasn't got BPA in it was um, important because people forget that clothing has plastic in it. <laughs> and I mean, we're not, we banned BPA a while ago. So this was just my own learning. Um, and I think uh, we went to Copenhagen and we, there are a lot of certifications around at the moment. There's almost too many certifications um, to know. So, you know, some guidelines about for consumers about what are the authentic ones that you really need to look up. And I love the fact that all the brands that are really doing it properly now, they're starting to list those. Ellen McCarthy in England, who you would both all know about is just doing so much research into all of this as well and so and so they're a good resource but i think bringing it back to australia for us was critical to that part of the process and i think that then is just an entree into what Vina's saying that then how do we do that differently and turn it into something that's much better than what you could get unfortunately sourcing that that fiber and fabric in Australia is not easy. And for some of these things, you just can't unless you buy the fabric pieces. And then we've sold our mills, a lot about not many mills available, not many um, yarn making sort of operations. A lot of our machinery from what I'm finding from ringing around people, they've sent it offshore so that they could use the cheaper labor offshore to make it. So, I mean, they're big issues. Great question. Mm. I mean, it's actually, I've heard of stories of, of companies actually requesting for their equipment to be sent back from overseas Come and back. the people that mm. they've actually got them housed over there are refusing to send them back. Oh. So um, there's mm. been some interesting conversations. <laughs> um, so I we suppose... We can yeah. as well. Uh, I guess this is the point, right? If you have manufacturing, then you can actually start to manufacture high quality machines as well. So <laughs> it's I think to me, it's it's again that challenging at the high level with the whole of systems thinking that if yeah. we were to have, you know, all the fabulous manufacturers who can do all of this work, and if we say, well, why can't we make the machines ourselves, right? So yeah. I think to me, again, it's about mm -hmm. once we start to challenge the norm, as we are doing here today, I think in so many different ways, people are going to realize that, yeah, actually, you know what, we can do it ourselves. And this is where, of course, lots and lots of manufacturing technologies. And really, you know, we've talked about value so many times. It's about creating high value products. And if that means mm -hmm. a machine or a part or a component or, or a fiber, I think in all of those cases, it's about really challenging the norm. So yeah, it, it's, um, I guess it's, it's one of those things that we will actually come out of all of this, um, you know, really in a, in a far more positive and an energized manner. Um, we have to. We have to challenge business as usual. Thank you very much, um, Bina, Annie, Kate. It's been an absolute pleasure having you.
as our guests as a Macquarie incubator and listening to your amazing um, depth of knowledge and breadth of knowledge around this topic, which is um, something that needs to be at the heart of um, a lot of decisions that need to be made in the near future uh, by mm. our government um, and all the other key stakeholders that are part of the circular economy and how we make these things happen and make people accountable for, for what they're putting into, into the world and onto our shelves and into our homes and on our backs and in our food, really. Um, so it's, it's, that, it's that pervasive. Um, so thank you very much for your time. Um, and Good we job. thank everybody that was able to attend today and encourage you to, um, you know, sign up to our newsletter and find out other events that we'll be we're hosting. We have Ali Khalifa, who's um, going to be joining us next time. And he's um, all about ocean plastics and has been in this space um, in ocean plastics for quite a while now and has just joined a group that are looking at how um, they can mine the ocean plastics um, for Indigenous cultures around Australia and what they can do um, with that. Um, so it will be interesting to hear from him uh, next month. So thank you for joining us, ladies. And um, Thank you. We hope thank to you. keep in contact with you all. Thank you for having us. Thanks, Mel. See you, Mia. Bye, 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 Kate. You. <laughs> See you, Annie. See you, Kate. Thanks, Mel. Thank you Bye. for having us. Absolutely, anytime. <laughs>